Uh, so Dr. Christine Jenner will be opening up with her uh, infamous or famous uh, presentation on economic segregation and housing and equitability. Uh, she'll go through that and you will love it. If you haven't seen it, this will be my fourth time seeing it. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, I'm sure you've heard from others about how great it is. Um, after that, we'll go into, we'll have a Q&A with Christine and then we'll have a panel. Uh, panel will be composed of Pedro Martinez, our superintendent of SAISD. We'll have uh, State Rep Diego Bernal, uh, Victoria Gonzalez from the mayor's office, Steve Indo is here from, he's the chair of ULI, um, and do I, have, do I have my fifth, have my fifth here? I do not have my fifth here. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the panel after, after Christine's presentation, but I'll go ahead and let Christine start, and uh, oh, you need to look for your notes? Okay, go for it. Christine's gonna look for her notes, yeah. How many of you live in the area? Which area? <laughs> How many of you live in Dignity Hill? How many of you live on the east side? Awesome, good, east side reference. How many of you live kind of in the urban, inside of 410? Outside of 410? Outside of 1604? Good, got one, awesome. <laughs> awesome, all right, I'm gonna let Christine go ahead and do her thing and then I'll be back. Do we need mics? Wait. There. Do we need mics? Yeah. Much yeah. better. Hey, yeah. so signal to me if I may drop it, because uh -huh. I don't pay attention. Uh, so you're here for the long haul. So this is great. We, I, I figured a lot of people would come to see to see the panel, but like skip their first the first part. So thank you for being here. Um, Let's just start. We have, we have smart words. Let's just start. That's just a screenshot because the um, when Martin Luther King wrote uh, the the call for the social and economic justice, it was never officially published. I don't think um, it was part of his Poor People's Campaign, which followed his civil rights work. The civil rights work by then it was written in 1968, shortly before he died, and the civil rights work. He actually came to realize, and along with his opposition to the Vietnam War, that, and I'm gonna, and I want to quote it, he says, what, um, what's he, for his, um, for the Poor People's Campaign, he said, what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't earn enough money to buy a hamburger and a cup of coffee? And this is where he started, really, what he called the people's, the Poor People's Campaign, and what's, to be known also as the social and economic, and I wish I could make that bigger, but the social and economic bill of rights. And so it's this, it's this document that's on file, and it's all written in courier font, and I really wanted to show it to you because it's just a really beautiful document. But basically, he said, he said that, we, that, we, that, that the civil rights, the civil rights kind of conversation has taken off. And we've had some legislative victories and some policy victories with it. But really, we're, not, we're still not going to get anywhere without social and economic equality. And he, and he wrote this, and he says, and it's a much longer document than this, but he says, we need a right to a job, every single person. And this was poor people, so it included everyone. Right? It's everyone needs a right to a job, a right to an income, a right to a decent house, to an adequate education, and the decision-making process, really in voting. Um, and full benefits of modern science and healthcare. And he wrote, without those, these rights, neither the black and white poor, and even some who are not poor, can really possess the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is where it was going. His, and again, his opposition to the Vietnam War is actually the legacy that he's better known for than this. Um, and the thing that I want to draw everybody's attention to is, is all of these rights. These rights that he talks about are uh, the job, income, decent house, neighborhood, education, participation through voting, and health care are all very, very related to where we live. We get most of those rights, which then become opportunities through where we live. And so when we talk about the economic and social bill of rights in San Antonio, we also have to talk about our neighborhoods and where we actually live. He knew that this was going to cost billions of dollars, but he also said that the investment from that would pay off. And we know that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. I want to talk about where we live. 
So that's what I'm going to do here. Let's talk about where we live. That's where we live, right? All of those, and, and I'm going to zoom in, because all, all that gray on there is individual little pieces of property. Um, that one is mine. The little pink dot, if you can see, is mine. Little tiny bit piece of property. That one is mine. Zoom it in. There it is, right? So just a, a little tiny piece of property in a big county of a million and a half people. But what's interesting about where we live is it dictates our ability or our opportunities that are available to us through all of that list that he said. So first of all, what school do my kids go to? It's determined by where I live, right? Where do I vote? I, I'm in District 1. There's my little house. But that's, I'm in District 1, and I, you know, our um, council rep is sitting there, and it's Lloyd Doggett, and I don't know my, all my numbers. But how do I participate is very much depending on where I live. And for most of us, that's the story. There are some of us who actually fulfill a lot of those needs through the market. So it's not as dependent. But for most of us, in the middle and working classes, very much depends on where we live. Right? So there's the little house, the little tiny piece of property. Right? So the degree to which those rights depend on where we live is very much a function of income. For the, for the higher income, not so much. We can go to school where they want. They can get health care where they want. Right? They don't vote where they want, we hope. We don't know. Um, but you know, education, health care, the job, you, know, you, you, you can work where you like. But for a lot of us, we're very dependent on that. So we need to think, as we think about the dream of social, the Economic and Social Bill of Rights, that in that dream, we need to think about, about our neighborhoods and, 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 and where everybody lives. Um, and, the, and finally, just as far as this prologue to what I want to really get at, where we live in the city of San Antonio is highly segregated. And we know that. And not racially and ethically, yes, but even more so economically. We've been identified, I think right here, we've been identified as one of the most economically segregated cities in the country. Right? So the Economic Innovation Group wrote last year, and they've got their own metric and statistic that says that we're, we're, we've got the highest score for spatial inequality. Pew Research Center, one of the greatest research centers in the United States, says we lead in shares of lower income households residing in lower income census tracts. Again, they say, then they, they go on to say that the more economically segregated a metro area is, the less economically mobile its residents are. And so there we go with the opportunity. Right? So this, what, what's going to be interesting is how are all of these things tied together? Right? Um, and finally, Time Magazine. San Antonio designated the fifth least literate city in the United States. And what I, what, the point that I want to make, and I think that will be followed up with in the panel, is that these things are very tightly tied. Socially get our bill of rights is tightly tied, or our ability to realize that is tightly tied to the, the, the economic segregation, which again is tightly tied to the illiteracy rate in our, in our city. The San Antonio Express News picked up on this last year. They said if you're born into a more prosperous part of the community, you have a significantly better chance of achieving profession and education. If you grow up in our more distressed neighborhoods, you're destined for a life in poverty. And so again, getting at the dream of social mobility. Right? Can, can I tell my kids that you can grow up to be anything that you like? Or, it's, or, or really is it much more a function of where you live? Um, they, again, they follow up and they say for the past 50 years, 78207, that census tract on the west side, right, just west of, of downtown, has been defined by poverty, inequality, and a sheer lack of opportunity 50 years, right? So this is, this is intergenerational. It's not just that a neighborhood deteriorates. This has been going on for a really long time and continues. Just as far as vocabulary, I, I, it's, it's the vocabulary and this is really important. We're not the poorest city in the country. Actually, we're number 26, right? That's McCown. We're not the most unequal, meaning the, from the highest, the very highest income levels to the very lowest. That's Miami. We're actually number 54. But we're the most segregated, right? So, if, so, so say that you make a, a lot of money and I make a little tiny bit of money, and we live really, really far apart. So that's our distinction, not so much the others. Um, and we can see it when we start to map it. Let me see if my little dot. Yeah. If we, no, it's not going to work on this. But when we start to map income levels, we can start to see it 
we don't appreciate it yet, but we can start to see how separated by distance we are from the lower income, and I use color to, 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 signal, um, to signal quantities. So a light color means low quantities of income, dark colors mean high quantities of income, and they're, and they're spatially separated from one another. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the story that I want to get into here. So my goal is really to demonstrate that there's a link between our current segregation and our inequities, right? And, and our inability to fulfill the dream of social and economic rights. So that's where we're going. So I've got a presentation, right? First, first part of it is how did we get into this situation of such, such tremendous economic segregation that we've been identified by national think tanks as the most segregated place in the country. And then if, I, if, if we can get to that, if we get through that and I can convince you, then, then we want to think about how did it, you know, how did that create then? Just economic segregation does not mean that we have to have inequities, right? But it does. It, that's how here, how it's very much materialized. So that's the next step. And then finally, what are we going to do about it? And that's the panel. That's where the panel is going to come in. So this is background, right? There's lots and lots of ideas about this. I'm going to present you one idea based on research, but it's one of the ideas about how did we end up, how did we create the situation that we live right now? There's lots. We like to live with our own kind, right? We hear that all the time. Racism, classism, exploitation, corruption, deindustrialization. The really big one right now out there is individual choice, where if you pay attention to the, like just the common, kind of, kind of a common understanding of how we became so segregated and so unequal, is that some people make bad choices. And we hear that a lot, you know, in a lot of different kinds of language, but we hear that a lot. The reason that I even do that is I start with that is because the policy, the policy implications are very different. On like how we understand the situation would actually lead us to very different kinds of policy. Right? So if we think people are making bad decisions, then we need to teach them to make good decisions and everything will be fine. And that's actually not the story that I'm going to tell. Because the story that I'm going to tell is based on property. So again, another explanation out of the hundreds of explanations. This one's based on a story about property and property rights, right, that then have turned into inequalities and inequities and the inability of, for some of us to get ahead socially and economically. Because in the United States, it really does, everything really does go back to private property. Private property was protected long before civil rights were protected. Private property is what was originally written into the Constitution as life, liberty, and, and the protection of property, right? Um, and that was changed later. But, it, but my argument is that, is that a lot of this is going to go back really to private to property. And so we need to talk about the creation of this. And this gets deeply historic. So, so hold on and have patience. Right? So we're going to go back, and we're going to look at tons of maps, because I'm a geographer, and I map everything. That's how I make sense of stuff. Tons of maps, right? Um, the, old, the old Old Bear County, late 19th century map. Um, you can see that the, the, the six by six mile square, my pointer doesn't work on, these, on the fancy projection. There's the old six by six mile square, right, of the old city. Um, you can even see, and even in this map, even from a distance, that you can see the gridiron pattern of the streets, so the streets are going in. On the, around in the county land, all those are old land holdings from the old Spanish land grants, and they're often long and thin so that everybody's got a little bit of the river and can then irrigate the rest of their property. It's a fascinating map. But I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom into the inner city because this is an inner city story. So here we go. Yes. It's a map just of the, of the old six by six mile square. And my very good friend right here, David Haynes, and I do this for fun. We map neighborhoods. And we go to the county courthouse and we look for when those neighborhoods are platted, right? From when they were originally platted. And it's a similar process to what a developer does today. They buy a piece of old agricultural land or a land that they want to repurpose. They have to go down to the Barry County Courthouse into the city. And they plan it, and they get the regulations, and they do this similar process to what's going on today, right? all the way back there. And so what he and I have done is to go back into that, back into those old documents, and find out when did that, when was that neighborhood built, 
right? What was it, you know, what did it look like when it was first built? Who's building it? How big is it? What do the houses look like? And all of that kind of stuff. So, so this is what we do for fun. Well, you wouldn't want to see us on an off day. <laughs> this is what we do for fun. Um, this is even, a, a, and this is again is David's work, but uh, BG Irish was one of the really big land developers back at the turn of the last century. And, and you know, and it's just like if you open the Express News today, it's Sitterly Homes, it's got a new, you know, development out past 1604. Same stuff, right? So BG Irish is putting in all these new subdivisions, Highlands on the southeast, Right, um, there's Lorraine Place and where Myrtle Lawn and Bracken Ridge and Beacon Hill. All of these are these are some of his developments, right? Just same stuff. So let's look at a couple of these, right? Let's look at these. These these are our neighborhoods, and these are our neighborhoods that are just getting developed. And um, and so that's almost Park. Yeah, it's in the it's in the it's in the county, not the city, but almost Park. Really beautiful, right? When these were done, they were done by hand and. Just real beautiful kind of depictions of the neighborhood. Well, um, Almost Park is right up here, right? It's right up here. Um, where it is today, right? Just, just a map of it. Beautiful housing, if you're already in there. Lying off in limestone, really pretty, pretty housing. Um, and there's the original deed, right? Everybody's got a deed to their house. And the deed for, and you have to trust me, because I, I know you can't read this, for, for, um, for the houses in Almost Park, it said that they, uh, the exterior, they're constructed out of a particular kind of ex exterior material. Um, this is about the buildings also. This is about the garages and service entrances. Nothing can be worth less than seven seven thousand six hundred dollars and now they sell for well over a million. Uh, let's see, third, these are all the restrictions. No part of the almost part of states shall be owned, leased, rented um, in whole or in part to any person other than of the Caucasian race. Right? So this is, this are, our, as our neighborhoods are developing, right? That's in almost part, you know, that's, it's highly elite. It's very, very beautiful. But let's look at some other neighborhoods. Bacon Hill. Beacon Hill, a bit rapidly gentrifying neighborhood today. Sweet as can be, right? Beacon Hill is right, we got Beacon Hill people in here, right in this area here. My fear it is today. Great housing stock, that old Texas bungalow housing stock. And it's deeds, right? Um, no tents, no, you know, not, I don't want tents, I don't want people living in tents either, right? Um, no, and, and, uh, and again, Stream, it's, it's expressly understood and agreed that any sale or lease of the said, uh, said premises or any portion thereof to any person of Negro blood shall immediately cause the title hereto to revert to the grantor, his heirs, and the signs. And these the houses couldn't cost more than $1,500. Um, Dignity Hill, we're sitting in it, right? Dignity Hill also, right, right east of downtown, also is deed restricted. Right, and there's some of the original, some of the housing is, is again really beautiful. By 19, it, it also was deed restricted, and by, 19, by the 1940 census, it's been released where you can go house by house and find out who lived in each house. Fascinating. Dignity <coughs> Hill, that neighborhood de and development ends at New Braunfels, right? And, on, and according to the 1940 census, and I coded this in this tan color. Um, this is how well the deed restrictions were working, right? Because this this area to the west, which is Dignity Hill and was deed restriction, is all Anglo-American. And then just across the street, right, on the other side of the Braunfels, I don't know what the leaves the leaves are, are African American, Mexican American, and with some Chinese shop owners as well. So these deed restrictions are working. <laughs> um, Prospect Hill. So we got we went north, east. Prospect Hill is on the west side, right? And the west side we think of as historically Hispanic, but it also we had areas of it that were deed restricted. Um, Prospect Hill is a little bit further west, over in, over right there, right? But there it is today. And, there, and again, no traditional, great kind of Texas bungalow housing stock. Harlandale on the south side. 
same story, right? There's the, the original advertisements for Harlan Mail, which were like in the light or the press news or wherever. Um, and this one, this one is, is amazing. This one says no, no, nobody with TB or any other infectious diseases. You can't sell wine. No tents are open air structured. And no, no part of the described property should be sold, leased, or rented to Negroes or Mexicans. And so this is a heavily, heavily restricted property. There's Harlandale. All of these neighborhoods that we look at, I mean, then we try to understand the history of when they're built are deep restricted. Right? All of these that we've that we've coded in this red. And so the question is, what's going on in here? Right? What's going on? In here, a lot of this is, is gone due to urban renewal and the railroad and a lot of industrial. This is still here. What's that? that what's going on there? People live there, and that's exactly the question we asked ourselves. So, looking at in these neighborhoods, and then there's a couple of things that I want to really draw your attention to. Is one of them is scale. Those that I was showing you before, those are significant neighborhoods. These are going to be smaller. This is Gardendale, right? Um, over by the, where the creeks converge, where some of the big creek projects are going to go on in the next couple of years. This is Gardendale, right? There's the housing stock. Much more humble. And here's the deed. And these deeds are really hard to trace. For some reason, they're just harder to trace than others. No, no restrictions here. No sign of restrictions. And when I, when I go do the 1940 census thing, I find that it's actually quite integrated. There's, and, and this is fun. This is, so there's African American, Mexican American, Chinese, English, Italian, people from Louisiana and Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so lots of people are living in that, in that little neighborhood. Right? Here's some more. Right? Um, so this one, this one is, I don't even know what that one's called. Colonia San Ignacio is here. Right? There it is today. Little developments. There's the housing stock. Right? There's the deed. No restrictions. Right? Um, plat of the big five block. There it is. There's, there's the housing. Sitting on the street. Right? There's no room for infrastructure here. There's no drainage. There's no room for sidewalks. Um, when this thing floods, this gets into the houses. Right? That's how close those houses and that's how, uh, how, how troubled the infrastructure is. Right? There's no deed restrictions here on these. There's another one. Right? There's a street. That's not an alley. That's a west side street, right? That could be an east side street. But these houses, and, and these are not deep restricted. There's the housing, right? So, so this, so this is interesting. I think, yeah, this is helpful. This is an area on the west side where one of those deep restricted <coughs> neighborhoods bumps into an area that wasn't deep restricted. So, for those of you who can see this. This is zooming. This is today. This isn't like I can go back to like 100 years. This is today. Um, zooming in all the way to the parcel level on a map, and can you see, especially if you're closer in, maybe help me, the difference between the area that was deed restricted and the area that was not? Yeah. How do you like? What's what is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. And just ima now imagine the houses that are that that those pieces of property can handle, right? This is, these are bigger, bigger, bigger. They're much more regular, right? These are smaller, density and, there's density and, there's a, and, and they're irregular, right? Oh, in a lot of these cases, families actually went in and subdivided themselves. They subdivided their property themselves and then hooked in to the utilities and to, and to uh, different kinds of Infrastructure. And I know that SAWS and CPS goes through this stuff still today, is that they find this stuff. The housing on this, I showed you some pictures of it, is, is very, very different than the housing on this, right? This was white. This was not. And housing, it, for most of us, and I've got statistics coming up, I think, um, our housing is our bank account. That is how we accumulate wealth. And if you're starting out the, the, that story here, your ability to accumulate wealth is going to be very different than someone starting the story up there. Um, just kind of, again, just looking at where those neighborhoods went. Oh, right, story's not done. 
this thing in the store was done. That's the 1920s, 1930s. By the 1930s, 1940s, just, as, just one, one, one additional thing. What I was just showing you, that was between you and your developer. It was perfectly legal, it was a nationwide practice, but it was very much between you and your developer. By the 1930s, 1940s, in order to try to get us out of the, out of the, um, the Great Depression, the federal government gets involved in this whole thing. And how they, they got involved was they, you know, the United States government does not build housing. Insignificant the amount of housing that they build. But what they did do is they said, banks, you need to start loaning, loaning money again. And the banks said, no way, we're in the Great Depression, everybody's going to default. And the, and the government says, no, they won't, because if they default, we will back you up. We will guarantee those mortgages, right? We will we will pay if that happens. FHA mortgages, Federal Housing Administration mortgages. Brilliant, right? And it did get the banks lending money again. But banks said, we're still we still can't take the risk. And then so the, what they did was they said that so the FHA goes, fine, we'll tell you where to invest. And they went to every city in the country. And they said, this is when the suburbs were built, right? This is FHA housing. That's when the suburbs were built. Right? So we're talking about a little bit later. But they said, for your old neighborhoods, right? It, and, and they literally came. They came and they did an inventory of our housing. And they said, in, the, in, in your old neighborhoods, if the housing stock is good, right, and sound, and there's no room for infill, because infill's risky. We don't know what's going to happen. And the population is white. We, federal government, will code it green. And that's the signal to the bank, this is good. You know, you can make an investment there, it's not going to be a risky investment. And there it is, that's, that's those areas of town. Right? If your area was way out of decent housing stock, but there was some room for infill, unpredictable, but it was still an Anglo population, we'll code it blue. Right? And so there's our blue areas, that includes Beacon Hill, uh, includes parts of Highlands down on the south side. There's that housing stock, right? It's, this is the housing stock that's gentrifying today. It also had some infill, and you'll see in these neighborhoods that there was always some infill, some all littler houses, sometimes the duplexes, that don't fit in, but they look fine. They've aged well, they look fine. And it keeps it a little bit mixed income. We love that. If, third category, if the neighborhood was beginning to deteriorate and there was possibly small, but a non-white presence, it was coded yellow. And this was a signal to the bank that, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a risk. Watch out and think twice. Right? And here's, here's our yellow areas, right? There's a Harlandale house. And finally, red. And red, was, and red were those areas that the housing stock was deteriorating or not worth investing in, and this was a non-white population. The United States government told the banks, that's a risk, and you may want to think twice. Some didn't, some still did, but that was the official word. And there's our red line neighborhoods, right? And what, and what is it with, I mean, and those are those neighborhoods that were not deep restricted. So they were denied investment by the developers, and now it's the federal government itself saying, no, you're not, that's too risky. You can't invest there. You need a new roof and somebody wants to take out a home equity loan, not a good idea, right? They need to do it on their own. And we know that that housing continues to deteriorate. And so this is what that looks like. Sometimes, sometimes actually some really nice housing got caught up in this because they exaggerated the boundaries or it, or it, had, it had been a part of a neighborhood that had deteriorated. Including Dignity Hill. Dignity Hill, this area was redlined. And you can see that on the east side. Here's the original legend that said best, still desirable, definitely declining and hazardous. And that was that was to, 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 to banks, right? Um, and so when we start to put all of this stuff together, we realize that a lot of this was those non those areas that had not been restricted, that had been built by a different set of developers, and sometimes by hand. Very small, often in a little bit more haphazard fashion, some, and, and, uh, and, so, and then subdivided at times, especially in, in the inner city. Then we build the highways on top of that, and the highway structure itself is incredibly deliberate, right, in order to cut some of those red line neighborhoods off from the economic generators that at that time were in the inner city. 
Now they can move to the north, but what it did at, the, at that point was just to separate the jobs from the people. Very much so. Then we got really smart, right? Because on top of we've created that thing, right? And then we did this. Those were our original school districts. There were about 68 school districts. It comes up in the paper like every other day. Why do we have so many school districts? Don't complain. We used to have 68. Um, and there was a nationwide movement to consolidate school districts because these were rural, right? They were rural and there wasn't transportation. And they were, those were the old common school districts. And they have names that you would recognize. It was like the Hawk Hill Selma District. Um, and, the, and I'll show you in a second, there's the W.W. White District and the Hot Wells District and all of these, the Mackey District, all of these. But there's a nationwide movement and it's following from industrialization, knowing that children need to be able to read and write. And when these were common districts, they answered to the county. So the county would meet and do county business, and then they would break for five minutes and come back, and then they would do school district business. But they had no idea about anything in education, and especially in the professionalization of education that, that was needed in, in an industrializing economy. And so it's a nationwide movement to start to consolidate these districts. And then literally, they do this, right? It was, it was sanctioned by the state. You just do it on your own, right? And so they start, and this is in the school board minutes, they start making phone calls to one another. And, let's see, yeah, they start making phone calls. So here's Northside, right? All of these districts start making phone calls to one another. And they say, do you want to consolidate? Um, and they said, and they literally say, well, show us your balance sheet. What are you worth? What, how much debt do you have? How, much, how many assets do you have? How many kids do you have, right? How much is your property worth and how, and how much debt do you have against it? And all of these, all of these consolidate into what we know as Northside today, right? The successful school district. All of these into Northeast. Here's East Central, right? And south Side and Southwest. But notice the inner city, right? Now here's SAISD. SAISD's got, it used to be just the six by six mile square, but then it consolidated. Consolidated, but that was Los Angeles Heights, that was W.W. White, and that was Hot Wells. They did the same thing, right? They made the phone call and they said, sure, we'll consolidate. That one, Edgewood, Edgewood, Edgewood also, Edgewood called Northside. And they said, can we consolidate? And Northside says, show us your balance sheet. And then they said, no way, no way. You're not worth anything. Your property's not worth anything, right? If, if we consolidate it, then we're taking on debt. Um, just to be, just because it's funny, um, SAIC called Alma Heights, you know, Alma Heights said, show us your balance sheet. And they said, no, <laughs> no, thank you, right? And Alma Heights is a small, small district, and Edgewood is a small, small district, because at that point, they said, fine, if nobody would consolidate, then we will become an independent school district of our own so that we can raise so we can raise money through taxation. And they did. That's locked in place now. Now it's, it's, they changed the laws. It's become much, much more difficult to consolidate. You need a general referendum, from what I understand, to consolidate. Whereas these were really done at an administrative level. These were done through a series of phone calls. Um, so the thing, the thing to remember, though, is that this is based on those old deed restrictions, which is which, which then were regulated, right? And why is that property not worth anything? Because those are the, those are those inner city places that were not restricted in the very beginning, that then were redlined and were de and were prohibited from just any kinds of investment whatsoever. Right, so what have we done? By the 1950s, we created a highly differentiated social geography under incredibly exploitative circumstances and processes. And then it's the 1960s, right? And we got enlightened. And we said, no, that was all wrong. We need to do away with that. We need to bring equality and civil rights, right? We're going to bring equality to everyone. And how did we do that, right? So this is why I'm into the second part, part of this. Um, we're, we're moving into a, into a period of equality, but I'm going to argue that it actually creates more inequity, right? Because how do we do that? Equality. We brought global standards. Right? We brought global standards and we decided we're not going to treat everybody different anymore. We're not different. We're going to treat everybody the same, right? And that was brilliant, brilliant. So how did we do that? In the educational system, 
Brown versus Board, first of all, but then Robin Hood in Texas, and then, in, so that's in finance, but then in the, in the curriculum itself and expectations, it was teeks, tas, tax, then star, right? Let's treat every single child the same, same expectations, right? In the public investment system, rough proportionality, here in the city, 10 city council districts, let's divide the budget by 10 and spread it out evenly, great. Even in political engagement with direct democracy, supposedly every vote is the same, right? But what does it do? What does the cumulative impact of that decision do? Totally maintains the status quo. It just locked it in place. It locked in place the inequalities that we had inherited because of banks, because of just the, the, the difference in the starting line, where people are gonna be able to start. And that's what created the inequities that, that we talk about today. Right? So now we look at a, a, a map of the average income levels in the city of San Antonio, and we notice that, well, gee, the inner city is very poor compared to the outer areas. And then you realize, well, yeah, they are. They were redlined, and before that, they weren't restricted. Like, the outer, a lot of the outer neighborhoods were deep restricted. People were able to then accumulate wealth through their own houses, then borrow against their, against their house and send their kid to college, or even invest more in their house. Right? So, of course, that, those areas are worth more, and they continue to accumulate wealth. Right? So this is, this, just bear with me, because this is really interesting. An area on the west side that had been, and just one, like, one a map of just to zoom in of part of the west side, that had, the, the southern part had been redlined, and then just north of that, you can see the yellow, there's a little bit of blue, and then there's areas that were green-lined, and the little, Rectangles on top of that are individual pieces of residential property. So what this does is if it's coded brown, that means between 2010 and 2015, the appreciation of that piece of property is two and a half, ton, two and a half standard deviations below the mean for the county. If it's coded blue, it's up to two and a half standard deviations above the mean for the county, all right? So what we're looking at is that those areas that had been redlined a long time ago that were not deep restriction, those, those properties are actually falling in value. They're not appreciating like the rest of the county is appreciating. The areas that had been greenlined, and that's up around Woodlawn Lake, they're, they're appreciating at a rate higher than the rest of the county, right? That's what equality has done, is it's just maintained the status quo. If you, if you it, 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 were lucky, you know, if you, if you do own an air, a house in one of these red line areas, it's not appreciating. And how do, how do Americans save money, right, for their future, for their kids, is through our houses. But in these areas of town, we're, we've been unsuccessful. 75% of the average household's wealth in the United States is in our homes. That's where our savings accounts are. In, a, in an hour old red and yellow light neighborhoods, our housing's not appreciating, thus wealth is not, uh, not accumulating. And those neighborhoods have always been non-white. So yes, we're segregated, and our segregated segregation is heavily racialized. Just some wealth and income comparisons, when you look at income, right, just paycheck, how much people make, um, and, and, it's, it, and it's horribly unequal, right? And we know that, but look at wealth. Wealth is how many, uh, what, what's your assets? How many assets do you have, right? Stocks and bonds and all of that for some of us, but for most of us, it's our house. And then subtract out the debt, right? But it's wealth. Income gets me through the day, it gets me through the month. It doesn't buy me a car and it doesn't buy me a house. Wealth gets me through the year, and it, gets, and it allows me to give something to my kids. It allowed me, personally, to send my, my daughter to college. I brought it against the house. Now, if we look at wealth, um, for, for the Hispanic population, about $8,000. For the African American population, about $7,000. For the European, the Anglo American population, $111,000, right? And notice the difference between incomes and wealth. Anglo-American or European-American, the average income is much less than their wealth, right? Because they're accumulating in a very different way versus the Latin American and the African-American 
population is their income. That's what they've got. They don't have that safety net of a house to fall back on. Well, why not? It's not and, and is it because they made poor decisions? No. They were, they were unable to access this incredible ability for Americans to accumulate wealth and become secure through their house, right? That's the story. So just some, you know, and this is, this is out there. These are just graphs that I pulled off of reputable places just to make the point of these wealth and income differences. So there's just the income gap, but the wealth gap. That's the story that we're talking about here in San Antonio. So that, so, so just to see the amount of wealth that a family has, right? So when we see a headline like this one, for the past 50 years, 78207, it's been defined by poverty, inequality, and a sheer lack of opportunity. And you should, we should go, duh. It was created like that. That was intentional. It was created as a labor reserve. It was never meant to accumulate wealth, right? So of course it's still poor. That shouldn't be a mystery. Now the mystery is what are we and what, what can we do about it because it impacts all of us. So this is the this is the situation of inequity. And that's why we have this, this fantastic panel that's been assembled that's been assembled. So equality, this is exactly what we did. Right? We treated everybody, we, we decided first we we created this uh, 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 really this is with little kids, but a landscape. Right, of, of high, it's highly differentiated. And then we said, okay, let's treat everybody the same. But all it did was just created, it just kept everything in place. And now what we need to move toward is to, is to recognize that people have different needs in order to fulfill their, the, the social and economic rights that Martin Luther King begged for in the months before he died. We can't just treat everybody the same. We have to think much more deeply about this. And that's not easy. So with he, and he, he wrote, you know, he wrote, without those rights, we can never really possess the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We did this. We have done this in the past. And this is this is going to be my transition into the other into the other folks that are here. But we have done these heavy lifts in the past, right? As a country, we've done it. How? Social Security in 1935, right? Before the Social Security Act of 1935, as a senior, you were almost guaranteed, unless you were in the very, very wealthy, a life in poverty, if you were no longer working, because there was no social safety net. And now there is. And it increased life expectancy, right? Because, it, because just, the, 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 just that redistribution of funds and our ability to save, right, turned into more years because we were healthier and we were able to eat better and we were warmer when we needed to be warm and cold when we needed to be cold. The GI Bill created the American middle class, no question, right? Before, before, the, before that, we didn't have a middle class. We had poor and we had wealthy. And the, the ability for those men to come back and go to college created the American middle class of the 20th century. That's shrinking right now. But that all of those all of those different professions are said to come out of the GI Bill. Um, earned an income tax credit in 1975. This lifted about six and a half million people out of poverty, including three million children. Pre-K for SA could be one of these massive redistrib redistribution types of projects as we take that sales tax and we say that you know we voted on that and we say that this money is going to go for a quality full-time early education for these kids right not for everybody but for these kids right so that, so these are these massive projects that are actually possibly really doing it but they're 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 enormous redistributions of wealth into human capital right um, so now what? All of these different movements, all of these different movements are, we have, we, have, we have movements, we have talk about all of these, living wage, fair housing, mortgage interest, tax deductions, equity and education, we have all of this going on. Um, because of why? Because of this, right? I don't know who said this, you hear this occasionally, there's nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequal people, which is where we are today. We pride ourselves today on treating one another equally. We're, we're coming from very different places. And we, in, in order to rectify that, in order to try to get people caught up, it's going to take a lot more than just treating everybody equally. 
So that's my, that's the, the kind of an historic background. And I don't, yeah, you know, that's, that's where my contribution lies. So I'm looking at these others who are working in, this, in these fields right this very second. And they, they will continue this conversation on, okay, this is, if this is what we've inherited, just, uh, just in terms of San Antonio, and if this is what we've inherited, what would we do with it? If we can agree as a larger, as a, as a larger society and population that, yeah, we got to do something about it. So thank you. Bye. I'm going to give the mic right after the scene because we're going to have a little bit of Q&A in the crowd. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So. Questions? Phil, please just to speak loudly. Oh, y'all have any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. There we go. Awesome. Yes. There you go. Uh, good afternoon, Christine. Um, I have a question about stating that you made um, clear that when you mentioned that the status, the status quo continues, and you know, I think in the sort of trajectory of the, his, the, the history of the you know, 1920s, 1940s, the role of the federal government, in the 1960s, and you cover some of this, um, there was a lot that was done around fair housing, the Fair Housing Act, that then led to the creation of a number of programs to invest in communities. And so I'm just wondering when you when you say that you know the status quo has continued, um, if you can maybe provide a little more detail because you know I I would I, I have a, a bit of a difference of opinion on that, um, and, and, and I think it's because you know as I look at you know these um, instruments that were created created like community development you know CDCs community economic development corporations. It almost seems like you know the value that what they did or what they continue to do has not been impactful because the status quo has continued. So I just I'm wondering what your opinion is. On yeah, that. Um, a couple of things. A couple of things. First of all, the fact that wealth and income are still so heavily racialized. Everybody has increased in wealth, but we've all gone kind of like this, right? and that and and. We in San Antonio have a say, have the our middle class is, is Mexican American, and that we should celebrate. But in general, all of these these income levels are still heavily racialized. So I think that's part of the status quo. Um, we've started to chip away at that, you're right? In, in the 1960s, 1970s, up until the late 1970s, we were, we were actually getting some traction. And then with the neoliberal years of, of, of the great presidency, and since then, we've slipped back. So the middle class has shrunk. The differential between between high and low income is getting greater. And then, and then, kind of what the findings today on, on really the, this conversation is turning from income to wealth and accumulated wealth, and that's even greater. So yes, I think that some of those programs were impactful. But those programs, a lot of those programs are gone. Um, so. That would take a, and I'm doing this at a real macro scale, agreed. So, so yeah, to look at the, at the impacts of some of those programs is, has been done. It's in the literature. Um, very worthwhile. And to return to those is maybe that, maybe that, that we were onto something and then we stopped. Because so much of it is a product of a, of a particular administration. Right? So Obama actually had a decent urban policy program. And now it's stopped. And so many of those, or it it's, it's, seems like it will be, and so many of those, have a, they have a shelf life. And, they, and so from administration to administration. The New Deal, the New Deal programs lasted. <coughs> they've been chipped away. And then some of, the, some of the Johnson stuff lasted. But it's been chipped away. So, so yes, yes and yes and I'm a little bit more pessimistic than you are. But I think that the, the big thing from that, the, I think the big thing from that though is that we should, we should be willing to learn because maybe on a short scale, maybe I can't, I can't show that impact now, but maybe if, like in the 1960s, 1970s, if we just examined those years and we saw that there was a tick, right? So that something is happening here. And then it got shut down in the next and Reagan years. Maybe we can learn from that. So yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you. Please. Yeah, I heard the word neoliberal, yeah. and I realize some people gag when they hear the word used. But 
from what I have done, and I've done research on this, it appears that the neoliberal group that is responsible for everything that you put on the board uh, emerged in the 1870s. They were, in so many words, uh, having to play a stop and go game over the years because various movements came along that stopped them. And then they sat back and said, you know what, guys, we're going to come back and get our agenda. We're just going to wait for you guys to get tired. <laughs> now, my question to you is this. Uh, we seem to have a neoliberal situation in its uh, full-blown glory with Donald Trump as president. I'm wondering how many people in this room understand the historical aspect of the fact that there is a very dedicated mindset that has said that we want the Gilded Age because we feel that's the way things have to be. And frankly, if we have to wait a while to get it, so be it. We keep plugging away. I'm wondering if they understand the historical concept of these of, of that versus these programs that you were talking about that gave us action. Yeah, and I did I, I, I did slip that word in and, and I yeah, and to use like that coded language, I'm sorry. Um, I'm what, and what I'm doing is when I when I use I'm really differentiating the middle of the 20th century that was you had so many social programs really intended to provide the social safety net and actually did lift a lot of people into the middle class and those have shrunk. All I'm trying to say is that the neoliberals actually started out in 1870, oh, yeah. and frankly, as I said, they had the stop and go type thing, and now all of a sudden, as I said, with Donald Trump, we're the back. neoliberals yeah. are having a field day. Yeah, we're back. Right, right. It started earlier than him. Yeah. So I live in Beacon Hill, and we have become one of those neighborhoods that people seem to want to aspire to, or it seems right to aspire to. We have become incredibly economically diverse. But the, the problem is, is that keeping those neighborhoods diverse is what the issue, because it, it starts to hit a turning point where it will no longer be diverse. And as our schools, as our SAISD schools are improving greatly, and now people that I know that have sent their kids to private schools or they've sent home school want to send their kids to local schools, the children that need to benefit from that the most, our neighborhood kids, are going to be displaced because the parents can no longer afford to stay in those schools or they can't afford the rent in those buildings to stay in those schools. And what do we do to combat that? How do we continue to keep, not make neighborhoods diverse, but to keep neighborhoods diverse? Mm -hmm. What are our tools? It's like that is, <laughs> and that is the past. Some, some of them, we need to make them. Honestly, we're, you know, and, and, and a lot of people here, and I'm not going to take this conversation because it, it's going to continue with, with the panel, is that we're in the process of trying to inventory those tools, but also knowing that we don't have the right tools, right? So a lot of people, and myself included, um, we have a mortgage that we can handle with the income taxes, or the property taxes are gone, have gone up at such a rate that I can't, I can't pay the taxes, right? Um, it happened to me. And, uh, and, and so there's, there's a huge, there's an enormous conversation right now about property taxes, but, but there's very little we can do about it, because that's a state issue. And so, and, and kind of educating ourselves on this, on the kind of jurisdictional problems, is that what can we do and what can't we do? And for those things that we can't do, well then we need to be better advocates and get good people into office, right? You're disagreeing. But. No, not just, but but I don't think, I mean, sometimes we think of it only as a state issue, but there are things like the city incentivizes development yeah. um, of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Why can't they incentivize landlords who already own properties across mm -hmm. these neighborhoods right. to keep their to keep their rents at a reasonable level? Yeah, and these are the tools that, that I'm, I'm thinking that we are going to come up in the panel because we have a housing expert on the panel. Um, but the, the moratorium that was just placed on incentives, Yay, right? And the fact that we have invested how much money and it didn't create one affordable unit. And maybe there was a time for that, maybe for a year, but it, but it went on for too long. And this realization that, okay, we've got, it, that's public money, who are we investing in it? Because it is public money. And do we have, do we, the public, have a say in where we're investing that money? 
it's more and more, it feels like we're starting, to, we're starting to do that because the outrage amongst a lot of us has gotten to the point where either we're, li we're louder or they're listening better than they used to. So I think, I think that this conversation is going to be in a minute. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on a question. You said you know, about trying to find the right tools. Where do you get those uh, crystal ball maps on which uh, properties are going to beat the market in terms of appreciation? Because if ordinary investors, that is the regular people want to buy a house, they usually go buy a house because they like the house. And then the bank maybe has this secret crystal ball map that goes, oh, sure, we'll lend you that house because we know that that is more than likely to beat pretty good appreciation trends, so sure, we'll give you. And, but you, you don't know that, because if you do know that, this is what she says and what people can do together, is you can start biting away at the red line areas that are very close to those ones that are doing well. You can buy low, start investing in your own housing stock, get all your neighbors and say, let's strategically invest in what needs to happen. This, they would bring up the price of the housing stock, and because we are in this map and we know we're so near, what the bank says is, oh, we're kind of near that area. There's no reason now that you shouldn't be able to share in that beating the market potential or your property appreciation. And you show them as a bunch of neighbors or a community that you've done these strategic reinvestments. And you should, no reason you shouldn't be change that map next time around when you downsize or give it to your kids and start enlarging the, uh, the uh, highly appreciating and wealth generating neighborhoods. Because you have access to the information the bank has, and then you can do community action together on investing. You hold. So fair housing reversed those, right? Fair housing, fair housing got rid of all of the red lines, said no more of that, thank God, President Johnson. Um, but we know that it continues. And we also know because of because this is an equity or an equity conversation that those 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 families and those houses themselves are starting at a much lower point. Right? And, then, and then have not been able to appreciate. What's interesting to me in, in, what, in what you said is those, especially those areas on the west side. Those areas that were redlined, that were not deed restricted long, long ago with the little tiny parcels and the little tiny houses is really, and the difficulty in those, in those titles because they've been, because of Texas and, and Texas law, they've been passed down through so many generations might be the saving grace. Because those neighborhoods, unlike one like, like here, those neighborhoods are very, it's, it's very difficult to do land assemblage. You know, so people, so investors aren't so, aren't so much worried or interested in those houses, because the houses are deteriorating. But they're very interested in the land. It's close to downtown, it's beautiful, and now we're starting to make public investments like the Martina Street, um, Martina's Creek projects. Right? Um, as as Alison Apache possibly gets uh, get, gets rebuilt, also major investments, this property is going to be worth a lot. The houses are, aren't appreciating, but the property could. And, 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 but it's so small and so legally tied up that, that it's good, but it's, it, that's hard. So this is actually something I think we need to think much more deeply about in order to hopefully preserve some of those neighborhoods. Because that's the heart of the city. Right? Um, this, you know, over here where you've got, it's, they're not doing land assemblage over here so much. They're just, they're, they're investing in individual houses and then and rehabbing them and investing in them and then sometimes some living them and sometimes selling them. Over there, it's a very different story. The different areas, different kind of different situations. Yeah. I don't know if I want to clarify that those, the red line and the deed restrictions and all that 50 years ago went away with fair houses. Yeah. So we said that. Yeah. But, but I mean, the deed restrictions, too, because we didn't Yeah, that's that point earlier. Yeah. Deed restrictions yeah. 1948. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, red line in 1968. But we pieces of property are still there. You know, we didn't go in and rebuild those neighborhoods. The little pieces, the little tiny pieces of property are still there that were created under those situations. Um, I was going to ask you, because I know you usually compare the relationship between housing policy, historical housing policies, and educational policy as to where we are now. But there are other systems. Um, to Lucas's point, you know, you 
are going to, you're trying to do your best, but there are things like mass incarceration and certain things that have really, really affected generations of families in order yeah. to be able to get ahead or qualify mm -hmm. for housing at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's another thing. Those other systems and those other policies need to be taken into consideration. Absolutely. As far as where we are now. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Two things. Um, I do think the conversation is starting to turn in housing commission and so forth. However, there's there's still an issue in the sense that they're focusing on this relocation assistance policy. And so the idea is we help these people by moving them to a newer, better place. And I'm working right now with some people in the Soapworks apartments who are struggling, and that's along the San Pedro Creek. The single mother with the three children, she does not want to relocate. She wants to be able to stay where she is and, and benefit from her money that's been used to improve the creeks. So that's number one. And to your point on the other creek investments, one of the problems we have on the west side is, number one, between the Alison and the um, Martinez, Santa Calabra, all of those lots is owned for multifamily 33, not single family. And so, and then you have a city policy that says you tear down houses that have become uh, poorly maintained or are owned by some lords and are becoming public nuisance. And so slowly but surely, we're seeing houses come down and that then provides for multiple contiguous lots that are vacant and available and zoned multifamily 33. And the zoning of multifamily 33 also makes the property taxes more expensive. So you have this combination of effects that is now looking forward and saying, okay, as this becomes more valuable, how are we going to usurp this land? So it's very timely and very important that we start addressing these issues. So I got uh, Brianna and then some of the other um, so I'm, I'm curious, a lot of the, the issues that you, that you touch on, like redlining, uh, deed restriction, uh, building up highways, um, property tax and stuff, like these are issues that happen on a federal level, federal level and we're even in some cases like redlining were federally mandated. So why, like why San Antonio? Like why is San Antonio the most segregated in if the country, if even in the state, because I understand that property tax laws differ from state to state, so like why San Antonio? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. And um, and thank you also. I don't have that response. But um, thinking about that question, and about uh, the why San Antonio, is, um, we grew up at a different time, right? So the city started to grow a little bit later than a lot of, especially northern cities. Northern cities, a lot of the, a lot of the infrastructure had, was in place, especially in the inner city, by the turn of the last century. Ours, ours grew up with, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, right? And we were building a lot of these non-deed restricted neighborhoods at the same time that we're building deed restricted neighborhoods. If you think about northern cities, especially with the great migration of African Americans from the south to the north, as they moved to the north, they actually moved into housing that was already on the ground. Right? The white population fled often into often you know to the edge of town. African American population moved in, right, into an existing infrastructure. What we, what, what we were doing is building it as we went along. And we were building it with very different kinds of qualities almost in mind. So in those restricted areas, they were built solid with, with decent infrastructure that now we're going back and fixing, but it was solid when it was built. We, we were actually literally building neighborhoods for a dispossessed population. Right? And it was built poor quality, and it continues to be 
right? It was not when we when we did away with the deed restrictions and with the redlining and all that. When, we, when that was declared unconstitutional, we did not go in and raise those neighborhoods and rebuild them up nice. They're still there. Those those uh, those are lines on the earth, just like these tiles are lines in this floor. And we have, we'd have to li literally rip the floor out to change to change the lines, and we would have to do the same thing. In, uh, in that, that in the, our landscape of property, which is our landscape of wealth, you follow. So uh, this and this this is me just like thinking. This is you know it's can I prove that? I don't know if I can prove it. But trying to understand exactly that question, and then you've got the historic racism on top of that. No question, I have no question, no you know about that. But this is you know this is just getting into like this is like just really like baked, scored right into the landscape, it, uh, you know, in, in addition to all of that stuff. But I think that, that it's something about the way that the city was originally built and the timing of the building helps us to understand why we get that title. Right? There, and, then, and, there, and then there's some things about our political geography also that, uh, that for example, the city of San Antonio is huge. So we have extreme wealth at the, to the north and extreme poverty to the inner city, but we're in the same city. So we are segregated. I'm from a city that's homogeneously poor. I'm from Rochester, New York. The entire city is poor, and it's, it is, uh, it's surrounded by suburbs where there's a lot of wealth. So the city's not segregated. Follow? The county is segregated, but the city is not. All right, so, it, so San Antonio actually, yeah, we're segregated, but we can do something about it because we can redistribute that wealth, which is what we can do pre-K for SA, right? Um, Rochester can't do anything about it because you can't move money across those political boundary lines. So there's something about the indicator itself that's a problem, but then there's also some things about how the city grew up and that we, that we actually really need to struggle with because we do we have some, some some housing that's deteriorating at a quicker rate than we can do anything about it. Yeah, Trish. Yeah. Um, before you go into the panel, the last point I want to make has to do with that deteriorating housing. And I wanted to come up with that you said. I love, um, I'm just going to stand up to believe in some period. Um, okay. You hear myself better. So I love the fact that you're talking about what I would uh, just casually call it like house flipping for investment in homes. Um, and I like the idea of having people who would do that with the community in mind. I think that's, yeah. that's great. Um, however, the one thing that kind of uh, triggered in me when you said that is that living in one of those neighborhoods, which, by the way, are, my deeds are gone that restricted people of a certain race from my neighborhood. Yeah. Are they, they're not in place anymore? Yeah, they're, they're not. Okay. Okay. They're, 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 they're in the apartment. Okay. 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 Living in one of those neighborhoods, <laughs> what I do see is I don't want the house, I love, the housing turning over is fine, it happens naturally, but we really want to keep people in their homes, too, and the existing residents there. And so one of the tools that I, I hope we, we get in that big toolbox that you're talking about is how do we have, uh, let's say, I'll call middle income, anyone who doesn't qualify for their federal really low income loans, but isn't wealthy. So in street world, we have on our street pavement something called the pavement condition index. And if it gets too low, you have to reconstruct, which is, which is expensive. But the city's goal is to keep everything within this range because it gets too low. If we could do the same thing for our housing stock, which would either be a revolving loan for people who could get a loan to just keep the stock in good shape, the existing stock, whatever, wherever, whatever its, its history is, that whether it's, and I don't know if that would be a, a, um, a, a city program, a nonprofit program, a private program, hopefully our panelists can address this. Mm -hmm. But is that something that we should consider putting in our toolbox? And the last thing I'll just say about that, while I have the floor, because I don't shut up, um, is that, and the reason why I say this is because my personal experience buying an older house in an older neighborhood is the time, effort, and money it's taking me to get that place habitable is astronomical. And um, the, in addition, so, so in addition to having the money there to do it, it's just the headache of doing it. That's also a big barrier. So a program like this could be, I'm almost done, could almost be like, uh, I got a CPS energy program uh, about five years ago. It's a 0% interest loan, which is great. The biggest 
blessing for me was the fact that it was control program. The five contractors that were available to do the work did the work. Every contractor that I hired for 10 years prior would come in, take out the plumbing, and never come back. Oh, they didn't come back to finish the job. They'd come in, start the job, and never come back. So, and these are all people that were recommended by friends. So, the affordable housing revolving loan with accountability that contractors do the work to keep the housing stock within an acceptable range, just like we do for our streets, is something I would like to see considered. Ian. Yes. 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 Um, I, I, we need to be on the lookout for a charter change, There's possibly a city charter change, because right now, the charter says you cannot use public dollars in a private investment. And, and, and I, I think that they're going to try to craft a charter change that allows us to actually, possibly with bond money, with public money, actually make maybe, maybe loans, maybe grants to individuals to invest in their house. But, but it would have to be a highly regulated. Yeah, but I think yeah. other, other cities, not the city entities, but other communities have had a private sector involved in loans that maybe could sidestep that, that could be conflicted. Yeah, and, and the, the thing I think that I'm up into here is yes, I mean yes, absolutely. But they're gonna they're gonna immediately ask, where's the equity in this, right? Where's if we're lending you money, where's your equity? My equity is my house. Well, my house is worth twenty thousand dollars, and now I have to put on a fifteen thousand dollar roof, really, right? So it's, so yeah, so it's gonna have to be a very different kind of conversation. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Um, again, thank you, yeah. Dr. Drennan.